go. All right, there it is. Um, all right, so my name is Rose Luna, and I am the CEO of the Texas Association Against Sexual Assault. Uh, so I was very excited to be invited to kind of share a little bit of my fumbles or lessons learned, if you will, as I started my um, journey into eat grant and my journey into doing this work. Um, I've been at TASA for too long, like 18 years, and I have been the CEO for two. It'll be three this September. Um, and as I, before that, before I was CEO, I was deputy director. So that's when I started to kind of see, okay, oh, here's some setups. Here's the infrastructure that needs to be in place. Here are some processes that would be helpful as we're writing grants and all those kind of things. So I just kind of want to share those here and there as Mark doing his presentation. Um, so, but TASA, we are the statewide coalition committed to ending sexual violence. For those of you who are, are not familiar with us, um, and we are also a CJD grantee. We get grants from the governor's office to do various things around the state in regards to sexual violence and sexual assault. Um, one of the things that we that I'm committed to is to make sure that our sexual assault programs and DV programs have a strong infrastructure in regards to finance, in regards to uh, processes, in regards to HR, in regards to programming. Because I think if when we have a solid infrastructure, it's very hard for, for money to get taken away and it's very easy to attract other money. So that's where we start. Um, I think this webinar is a really great way to start down that journey. Some of you are leaps and bounds ahead of the rest of us and some of you may be where we're at and some of you may be just starting and all of that is okay the information that we're going to share today um you may find some relevance in it and uh or it may inspire thoughts in other ways so again i appreciate you all being here and without further ado i'm going to allow mark mark hernandez he works for us at tasa and we're so excited because i remember the days when I first started at TASA, Mark was at the Attorney General's office and he did audits and we were all scared of Mark back then. <laughs> uh, Mark is actually a really nice guy, but he's super knowledgeable and he has been so helpful now that he's on the team with us. As TASA, we also go through monitor visits, we go through audits, and Mark's been able to kind of take away that fear factor that I personally had when it came to that. And I was like, oh, so we just need to justify everything and have a process, oh, and be consistent. Oh, I got it. Anyway, so it's things like that that I learned through Mark. And also there are compliance things that we all need to be well aware of and stay within. So uh, we're gonna start that process now. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Mark. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Hernandez. I'm the uh, financial nonprofit specialist for TASA. Uh, again, as Rosa said, uh, I have uh, funding experience from the Attorney General's office and also worked with Texas Education Agency as the director of, of federal audits. Uh, so I'm on a capacity grant from the governor's office, like all of y'all are on a, on a VOCA grant. Uh, my grant is to provide technical assistance, both financially, compliance-wise, audit, anything that deals with uh, uh, the federal grants in that situation. So uh, I'm always available. You'll see on the slides my, uh, my email address and phone number. That's how to contact me. Uh, one of the things before we get started, I'd like to make sure that uh, uh, as part of the housekeeping rules, uh, that everybody has their mic on mute so it's easier for everybody to hear in that sense what we will do there is a chat button where you can hit the chat button and, and ask your questions Finian, uh, our one of our staff people who's an auditor will be handling the chat uh, information and what we'll do is that, uh, as we go along uh, he will prompt me to uh, either answer the question or if I need another moment to get through a certain part of it, then we'll try to answer those questions. We also have uh, at the very end uh, a section for just uh, questions and what we plan to do with all the questions either during the uh, presentation or after it in that part. We will put all those together and do a FAQ list. So we will take all those questions, answer them and then send them out to all the programs that were on this uh, on this training at this time. 
we also do a couple other things at TASA. Uh, we have a financial listserv that we use for the memberships uh, uh, for all the financial people that uh, EDs would want them to be on so that uh, anytime I see something new or relevant that needs to be dispersed, we'll do that. What we plan to do is to have now another financial listserv that will be just for your group in that sense, and we'll get that out uh, later. Uh, that will be like, a, we might call it the child sex trafficking listserv or so. So that way, as we go along throughout the year, if there's things that come up, uh, I know that uh, last uh, October there was an increase in uh, the uh, dollar threshold for procurement. So we were able to get that out to everybody as, as quickly as possible. With COVID, that's another reason to have that because there's been uh, some changes into the grants that I think are beneficial and it's always good to get that information out at this time. So uh, uh, you can, if you like, uh, even before that time, uh, either put your email address in your chat box or uh, the best way is just to go ahead and send me an email and we'll get our IT person to set up the uh, listserv and that's how we will provide information. That's a good place also when people ask questions that other people can actually probably answer it at the same time or uh, that spurs another question through. So uh, uh, we'll start now and what I plan to do uh, with the uh, PowerPoint slide, I'm actually gonna go ahead and mute my video since I need to move my computer around some so that we can go through that. So we'll get started now. Let's go here. Mark, I didn't. We, I don't see a. Oh, there it is. Nothing. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna meet myself now. Okay. So, uh, oh, and we need to. I took it off. We'll get it started now. So, as you can see, uh, this webinar will be for uh, budget adjustments with the Boca Grant. We will go through the process. Also, kind of some common errors that will happen. Uh, one of the things in the discussion with uh, the governor's office, there's naturally as you begin going through the e-grant system that uh, there's common mistakes as you're learning to go as you go along. And those are primarily on the FSR where you're requesting uh, re uh, reimbursement. Our agenda will now be, so we'll talk about the common uh, errors on the FSRs. We'll talk about the budget adjustments, and we have a worksheet that I sent out that I think is a good template to use as a roadmap when you actually go into the e-grant system to do your budget adjustment. So uh, we'll go through that part, and then kind of a review and approval process. Some of the acronyms that we're gonna use at this time will be the CFR, which is the Code of Federal Regulation, uh, prior to that time, uh, grants were under the rules with the OMB circulars, and there were eight different circulars depending on what type of entity you were at the time. They've now put it all together in uh, 2 CFR, Part 200. That's where you will see the, major the majority of uh, the information. Each federal agency codifies that, but they will also ask for special permission if there's a specific thing that they want to put in. That's a little bit different from other federal grants. So uh, they're under their own CFR at that point. And from there, FSR is the financial status report. That's a federal term that started out and most uh, state agencies have adopted that. Uh, that's where you request your reimbursement and you get paid for it. It, it does show as a kind of your status report as a financial report. ODOE is the other direct operating expenses. Uh, that's pretty much the overall catch all for the budget category that uh, would not be personnel or travel or other things like that. That would be under other, other direct operating expense. So if you hear somebody talk about ODOE, we're talking about other direct operating expense. P-O-E-T-E 
is another part that you'll see in this uh, uh, program where if you go through the whole process of doing your budget assessment and it doesn't reconcile, it will go to this part and it will have links and we'll show you how to go through that as we go along. Now, most of the common errors on the FSR, uh, the first one is that if expenditures should be put in there cumulatively. Uh, there are other agencies that will ask you to put in by the specific months. And most people will think that's how you're supposed to do it in this uh, e-grants uh, database. And when you talk about e-grants, it is a database, so you need to think about it in that direction. Whatever you put in, typically it needs to have a balancing to it. So the other part is your, uh, another thing that happens too is the cumulative expenses exceed the cumulative expense in the e-grants, which is typically going over your award. And uh, in that situation, if you expend more than what you've been awarded, then naturally you will not, it will not allow you to receive that money. You'll more than likely need to do a budget adjustment with this program's for. Uh, the other thing that happens uh, quite often in that situation are the expenditures are uh, outside of the period of availability. Period of availability is basically the beginning of your grant which is on your uh, document, and it goes all the way through to the end of the grant. So let's say for the VOCA grant, it starts October 1, ends in oh. September. Any expenditures outside of that box is considered uh, unallowable because it's not within the, uh, the time frame of your award. Now, there are some times uh, where you can have startup cost that is outside of that, that you can uh, request expenditures for, but that needs to be prior approval. It has to be before your budget is actually set that, that the governor's office will allow for that. Uh, that doesn't happen very often, but it, it may in that kind of situation. So you can always ask before your grant gets started. And then finally, basically when, uh, when the VOCA review starts, uh, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to take what is on the FSR, which should be equal to what's in your general ledger. And that's where uh, a lot of errors come up. Either something's changed within your general ledger and you didn't uh, update it on to the FSR. Uh, that's where I see a lot of uh, findings. In place. So you want to make sure as you put into the FSR, that you're using your general ledger to make sure that you're in balance and you're uh, you're reconciled at that point. Okay, Mark, I have a couple of things. Yes. Can, you, can you put this, I'm sorry, can you put the slide back to the one before? Um, so this is Rose again, y'all. So I just wanted to share with you some of the uh, stumbling blocks that I had. So again, I mentioned to y'all earlier that I had been at TASA for a very long time. Uh, I've been CEO um, for two years now. And so it's been about two years that I got involved with e-grants and FSRs and all that stuff. And I, I personally totally changed the way that we do everything from the beginning. And I'll talk about that later as this goes on. But one of the things that I did, it was just a common error that, that it, it is, as the title slide says, it's a common error. Um, so we have all these different grants. And so on some of the grants, you know, you just do the month's expenditures and that's what you put into the form. Whereas e-grants, CDD grants are a little different in that you have to add that month to the current amount that's in there because it wants you to be able to see uh, cumulatively what you've spent thus far. At first, that didn't make sense to me. To be honest, e-grants didn't make sense to me. It, it seemed very counterintuitive when I first started that process. I, I, we have become friends now, uh, I have, with e-grants. Uh, but at first, I just did not. I was so counterintuitive. Or maybe it's just me. I'm, I'm, I'm a little odd. I, I, I get that. But um, I just could not understand that. But that was one of those big things. And I'm sure you all figured out because you, you all are um, grantees and have done that. But that was something that I had to learn. <laughs> Uh, actually, it took me more than once. It's embarrassing to admit, but I finally figured that out. And I think the other thing that Mark said was the FSR. So one of the things that's just a default thing that we do at TASA, even before I changed up our whole finance and process, uh, you know, coding and transparent financial system, is that we have always uh, used our um, budget to actual general ledger. So we, we close out the month, 
So for example, for our, our cycle is for June, we're going to close everything out for June at the end of June. Uh, we're going to submit our FSRs to CJD and every, and, you know, whoever else uh, on the first week of July for the June expenses, right? So what we do is we, we close down our quick, we process everything through our QuickBooks and those numbers, that's what we're reporting. And Are you guys going to use the desk or? All the, all the way through uh, from, from A to Z. So we get audited. Um, everything is the same. Sorry, I hear somebody talking. Is that a question? want to make sure I didn't miss a question. Um, so um, I just wanted to say, so anyway, so that's just something that I've learned. Uh, and, and I thought that everybody, I, my, I assumed, and you know, you know what they say about assume. Um, I assumed that uh, everybody was doing it that way. But as we, as I was doing this work with our rape crisis centers and sexual assault and DV programs, what I learned, um, yes, I will, I'll figure out how to mute everybody because I'm hearing some stuff too. Sorry about that. Um, what I've learned is that not everybody does that. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I just thought everybody did, had that process where you close down your books for the month, you do your budget to actuals, your general ledger, and that you use that information to place onto all of your FSRs. If you, if you're already doing that, that's great. If you're not, I would strongly consider that we can help. We can provide TA on how to do that as well. But again, that just kind of keeps you clear in case you get, you get audited or you get that desk review, all your numbers will match up if you're just using that. And that's a, that's a great start to a transparent system. Um, that's all I have to say there. Sorry. I'm going to try to mute everybody. I, I'm done, Mark. Okay. Uh, and that's, that's a good thought. Uh, again, most people would think that you add the specific month that you're requesting dollars. And some systems do that. Uh, the Attorney General's office, they don't have a, a database, so they use Excel spreadsheets and others. And that's how you actually uh, do it for that grant, where you, you uh, go ahead, your request for reimbursement is for that specific month. Uh, the e-grant system is built so that when you put everything in, you do it cumulatively, and then it will actually take the, the difference between what you just put in cumulatively and what you had before, and that is the uh, calculation that uh, is used to pay for the reimbursement at that point. So uh, databases do it differently, so uh, it's the way it's set up, but it's a good system to work through. Uh, now let's start with budget adjustments. Uh, there's really basically a couple of uh, reasons for doing a budget adjustment. You're either doing a modification, as I call it, uh, and uh, that's the term would be where you're changing within the total of your budget, just uh, the, the specific line items, and you might be changing from one cat budget category, let's say personnel, into other DOE or other things. The modification does not change the total award. It's just modifying within that total award. So, uh, and that's the majority of the times uh, when you're using a budget adjustment. Now, there are times that it could be an increase. Let's say that there's some money out there and uh, uh, the governor's office wants to go ahead and provide additional funds to each program or to, to certain programs. Then you can do the budget adjustment to increase your dollars. So let's say you get an extra uh, $20,000 to $30,000 that you uh, were not awarded at the beginning of the year, but now get it. That would be the reason to use your uh, increase in budget adjustments. There are times where it could be a decrease in budget adjustments. Uh, sometimes uh, the money is uh, short in this situation and they may ask uh, for a decrease across the board. Very rarely does that ever happen. Uh, the other reason that might happen is that uh, a situation where there is a lot of question costs that uh, programs will have to pay back and they can't pay it back with a check. Uh, they, uh, the governor's office may ask for the program to go ahead and decrease their budget so that uh, it will then take care of any of those additional dollars that were not allowed at the time. The last thing which is very rarely done, which is the CPI, which is a grant program income. Program income is the amount of money that you receive if you're charging 
um, victims or the public or anything with grant dollars. So let's say you get a grant and uh, part of that is to do uh, uh, training and other thing, but you charge for the training, then that would be a program income in that situation. And what happens with program income is that it, it actually offsets your uh, budget at that point. Uh, so uh, you receive the dollars, but then you don't get the full value of that dollar in the sense that uh, whatever your program income will be offset at that point. That very rarely happens, but uh, uh, that would be during uh, an award. If, if you're asking for a specific type of project that you're going to charge uh, the public or, or victims at that point. Now in the modification part, uh, the, reason, the primary reason to do a modification uh, it typically happens with lap salary. So you have a position that's been out there uh, and now the position is not filled. A lot of times it will take about three months. Well, there's the three months that you cannot charge because there's no, there isn't any activity to charge for that grant. You can use that time to move the dollars into another uh, category or uh, do one time uh, merit for another person in that situation. <laughs> Uh, we'll use that type of modification. There are times that may happen in the situation where you get a substantial savings. Let's say you did a lot of IT uh, procurement and uh, you were able to uh, have a savings of a couple hundred dollars to at the most, uh, let's say a thousand dollars. You can take that and then do a modification to move that money down because basically budgets are, are estimates at the very beginning. Yeah, you, you're awarded an, an estimated amount of dollars to use, but as you spend it, you'll see that there, you may get some cost savings or other things like that. The other thing would be uh, identifying other cost needs. Now this is kind of relevant with uh, COVID at this time. Uh, most, most organizations right now may have money in their travel where they're going out either conferences or to do training or to receive training. And with COVID right now, uh, programs are not, uh, are not allowed to really travel uh, because of that with CDC. You can take those savings of the dollars that you would have spent in travel and move it to another place. So that's how you would do a modification. Um, I'm sorry, Mark, I have a something yes. to add real quick. Um, so I think the thing to keep in mind too with your budget modifications is, um, and, and I'm gonna keep saying this and I'll say it again later. Um, I think even before you apply for the applicant, there, there's a lot of prep work that needs to happen on our end as, as, as uh, potential grantees or even grantees. Um, and it starts with your org budget. We're not gonna talk about that. That's a whole nother, I know it's out the, outside the scope of this discussion, but I just wanted for context reasons, you want to have your org budget, you, you know, all of us have different fiscal years. Ours is set by the, by our board. It's January through February, although our grant years are from September, uh, August, September through, you know, so, and then you build your applications based on the need from that org budget. So that's just, that's, that's that. But the reason why I mentioned that is because there are, there are cost allocation methods that you're using, these equations that you're using across the board that should always be consistent, even within your modifications. Um, so as, as mentioned here, you may have either a, a staff that leaves or you have two new staff or something happens and there's a slight change to your cost allocation depending on how you do that. That's absolutely okay. But I think the more that we can stay consistent with our equations and our cost allocation methods, methods and the math, the better off we are. And also the more prep work that you do before you do modifications, the better. So um, something that I learned the hard way is, um, I, I, you know, I knew I, I skimmed through the RFA, you know, before applying for the grant, I read through it because again, I was at TASA forever, but I wasn't in the grant world at TASA. I was doing trainings. I was doing the programmatic pieces. So I was kind of shielded from this. And then I, 
uh, came into this position and learned really quick that there's a lot of rules and compliance issues that, that we need to always maintain. But I think one thing that might help uh, with some headaches on this is to go back, uh, if you're not the one who wrote the grant, or even if you did, to always go back and read that RFA that this grant was based out of. That's gonna tell you anything that's allowable, the activities that are allowable. So as, as Mark mentioned in COVID-19, like even for example, for TASA, there's a lot of money that's left on the table because we weren't able to travel. Uh, Sexual Assault Awareness Month is in April. Guess what else was happening in April? That was right in the thick of, of COVID. Actually, we probably still are. But either way, uh, so we, there's a lot of money that was just sitting there. So, so um, I have made you know adjustments to our budget based on, again, I went back to that RFA to say what's allowable, what's not. You write up your justifications, you get your math together, and then you submit that. And I know he's about to go through the, the steps, but I just wanted to, uh, the lesson learned for me is to do all that on the front end. It just, it, it minimizes the back and forth from you, you and your grant manager. And it also just put, puts you on a strong standing uh, on the change that you want to make, it, it, even if, if they're, even if it's denied the first time, or, or or there's most of the time it's clarification. I just try real hard to stay within my my bumpers uh, and to stay in compliance. And you can do that by again reading and knowing back and forth that RFA and that application. And I think the other thing, um, again, is just having that clear clear justification when you're you're putting that into into your uh, budget adjustment. Okay. That's it for that one. Now we'll actually go into a sample of a, a budget adjustment. I've sent out uh, to everyone a uh, Excel spreadsheet that has that. Uh, so we're going to talk through that. If you did not receive one or want another one, uh, you can always through chat go ahead and ask for it with your email address and we will send you uh, the uh, Excel spreadsheet. So from here, uh, you can see that the spreadsheet, I like the spreadsheet. We actually used it at the Attorney General's office as part of our budget categories, areas to review. And uh, you can use this as a template. Uh, it's set up now more in the line with uh, VOCA grants. So uh, the cost categories should still be there. Uh, I think the only little difference there is that fringe, we like to separate it a little bit more before you actually put it in there. Uh, as you can see from here, uh, this uh, template you can take and copy again and then put your own information in as you go. What you want to do is, uh, in this example, uh, if you look down at the very bottom with my mouse, uh, the first tab is personnel only, so we're only going to talk about personnel changes in that area. Uh, the other one would be other expenses where we're taking it. I just moved it to another tab. We're taking money out of personnel and then we're gonna move it down to another category. So let's first talk about personnel because that's usually where a lot of changes will happen either plus or minus. In this example, we're actually gonna impact two uh, positions. We're gonna uh, decrease some money in uh, the counselor one and we're gonna add some money to the bilingual. Well, in this situation, why I like this form is that you have your salary to begin with. That's the salary of the, of the uh, individual uh, for the whole year. Uh, we'll skip the FTEs for a second. You'd like, it's good to have a year to date total so that when you start to change your budget, uh, it, it'll help you to make sure that you don't change it to where you're under the dollar amounts that you've actually already spent. So as you can see, uh, uh, for Counselor One, we've already used up $10,000 at this point at the time that the budget uh, adjustment's gonna be done. Uh, the next column right there is your current budget at this time, the one that was approved. And then uh, in the next column, increases and decreases that area, you either a negative dollars or positive dollars will impact your revise. So in this case, you can see that uh, we're taking out $1,000 from the counselor. So the dollar amounts have now changed to where it's smaller. The good part is we know that uh, since we have $11,760 and we look back at our 
year-to-date expenditures that it's 10,000 that we're okay, we're not changing too much to where we then have an error if that happens. In this example, we're actually gonna go down and we're going to add $1,000 into the bilingual uh, advocate. As we do that, it will then change the amount and we can see that in this case, uh, we only have about $405 left to, to charge on that uh, particular person in one sense, but we're okay because it's greater than what we have as our year-to-date expense. So the, that's why I like having that year-to-date expense to make sure that you don't uh, uh, have an issue of reconciling with the uh, budget itself. So now that we've done this part, you can see over here in the uh, current FTEs, uh, FTEs are full-time equivalents. It's a percentage of, of one position. So if you're, in this case, uh, all of the positions are 100%, but they're only funded out of this grant. Let's say for the staff counselor, it's 29%. Well, once we took out the dollars, it actually dropped to 27% at this point. And at the same time, as you can see, uh, the bilingual advocate at first started with 29% uh, of an FTE. And with the additional thousand, it actually comes up to 32% uh, of an FTE. Uh, this is very good because when you go into the system, it will ask you about your FTE. You can use this, I, I like this, I call it a roadmap. That once you do this, you can either print it or you can just, if you have two um, uh, viewing cells to do, uh, to work through, you can have one uh, over on one side while you're working on uh, your e-grant itself. But this helps to keep you in uh, reconciliation. As you notice, as we go through the increases and decreases, in this case, since we I uh, did uh, 1,000 to 1,000, it ended up being zero in the sense of the net effect. Uh, this column will go all the way down with each area. Naturally, if you're impacting personnel, you'll need to impact also the part of that personnel's fringe in that situation. So we actually took $100 out of the uh, staff counselor and we added $100 into the bilingual. Again, it was zero so that uh, we didn't go over budget or under budget uh, of our actual budget. And as you can see, as we go down in this particular situation, since there aren't any other uh, changes, it keeps you, it gives you a check that what your original award and what your new revised budget are still the same, so you know that you're in good shape, that you haven't over, um, overexpended or overcharged in that situation, or you didn't make, a, you, you're balancing with what you had before, what you, you need to provide. Now, moving over to other expenses, because this is what uh, typically happens also in a situation for this uh, sample, we took the money out of both of the positions. Again, staff counselor for a thousand, uh, bilingual for a thousand. As you can see in this case, since they didn't offset each other, it came up to two thousand dollars that you're taking out of that personnel area. We impacted the fringe for each one of them, so you can see that there's two thousand uh, two hundred dollars that we've impacted on that part. So we totally, total wise right now, we've uh, reduced the budget by $2,200. Now we're gonna go in and we decide that we're gonna add $700 to utilities. And now we're adding a position or a line item, which would be a laptop. And uh, the estimate would be uh, $1,500 in that situation. As you can see, we've increased other DOE by $2,200. So at the very end, the net effect is zero. You have your current budget and your revised budget the same. So you know that uh, you're balancing out and you're reconciling. 
I like this information because it's good as a roadmap so that when you go into the system and the system, you know, it takes time to get used to uh, going through each of the tabs to make sure you get to the right area. It's kind of recommended that uh, you can, it's best to go ahead and take all of the uh, negative dollars, your, what we call deobligating the dollars in the award first, and then re-obligating the dollars in that sense. Now the database system works to where uh, you can do it in multiple ways. You can take the money out and at the same time add money back in if it's in the same cost category. I kind of recommend if you're doing this kind of for the first time or haven't done it in quite some time, it kind of makes more sense to do it in a kind of progression. So the progression would be deobligate the money so that you know that you have money available and then re-obligate the, uh, the amount back to make sure that you're not going over your budget. Mark, um, yes. can, I add, can I add something? Yes. Um, so the first thing I was going to say is this is a great worksheet spreadsheet to keep, you know, it, it keeps everybody, your finance person, your executive director and whoever else is in that mix to know here's what the budget is for that grant. You know, here's the adjustments that we want to make again, be, you, know, you want to always be proactive in these and, and have a clear like plan and and make those adjustments and clear justification. But but also one of the biggest things that I learned when I first started doing these things is yeah, again, I'm going to tell, you know, make myself sound real dumb, but like I went in there and didn't realize, you know, I don't know why, but I just didn't realize that, you know, if I was awarded, let's just say $500,000 and I wanted to make an adjustment that I had to adjust that. I couldn't just add because I wanted, I, I thought this was a great idea and it fit within even the RFA and whatever else. I had to keep everything within that 500,000. So if I took from here, I had to add it to there and take from, you know, so this spreadsheet is a good way to just kind of keep it at that level and to do those equations in between. Uh, the difference between this spreadsheet and what's happening on e-grants though, is usually an e-grant for your personnel items, fringe and salary are just in that one line item. Uh, but this is a good way, I think, depending on how you calculate your fringe and your personnel to keep them separate. And then also in there, when you're doing your calc, you always have to show your math and all of those things to, to put, this is how much salary, this is how much friends. Fringe. So this spreadsheet is good for that. But I had, there was a question that was asked to me. And it was a good question. The question was that if actual percentage staff time spent on the project varies month to month, how do you reflect this in your FSRs and budget adjustment? So I'll, I'm going to take a stab at that first, Mark, but I think okay. you have to clean it up because you're the CPA. Um, <laughs> so I feel like when that happens, so you have, hopefully, you know, everyone's using timesheets where everyone's you know, first of all, your staff needs to be aware of what grant they're on. Um, there needs to be that transparency when they're hired or, or whatever, or they're moved to this position, that they're on this grant, th these are the activities, deliverables, if you will, for this grant. And when you're doing this type of work, you know, you, you of course notate that on your timesheet. Uh, and I know that people do that differently across the board. I personally want to get more guidance uh, on what's best practice. But I think being honest and kind of billing that grant for exactly the work that needs to be done on it is, is, the, is the, always a good start. So to answer this question, I think you, you look at the timesheet and you, you, know, you calculate those hours, you put that into your QuickBooks system or whatever accounting system you're using. If that amounts to that month, that person you know, used $500, we're gonna bill $500, whereas the month before, it was 800, but this month is only 500. I think you keep it honest by having, as I mentioned, that budget to actual or general ledger sheet. You're, you're, you're putting it into your QuickBooks, you're billing it to the right grant classification line item, and then it, it's reflected there. So whenever that person is entering the FSR, they're entering that amount. So it's again, from point A to Z, it's all the same from that timesheet to here. So then as you're saying, how do you work that adjustment? So as you're getting closer, and I'm sure like I know it's something that we do is financial projections. I'm looking at how are we spending down this grant. And that's another great thing with e-grants. At first I thought again, oh my God, how weird is this system? But what I like about it and the whole cumulative thing is you get to, you have like this dashboard to see where you are with your spending of the grant. That's a, it's like an almost a tool for you as you're, as you're doing financial forecasting, not only on your organization, but per grant. 
So as you start to see like this example, you know, that's using different percentages, you know, hopefully it evens out because when you write the grant, you kind of, you know, you have that purpose and you have a, a plan to, to spend that money down. Uh, but you're also wanting to reflect, it sounds like the actual hours spent on doing that. Um, if you start to see that, oh gosh, you know, we didn't see that many clients or whatever the case may be, I think there is going to be, and there's a significant amount in that personnel line item, you would just do that adjustment to something else. Again, that is, um, and that would be your choice. If you may discover, oh, we, we can travel now and we need to go to this conference, whatever, you know, whatever allowable expense there is, you, you can make that adjustment uh, to something else. Another thing about adjustments that I heard loud and clear, so TASA and TCFE, we, we brought together all the major funders in Texas because we, we wanted to make sure that we could give guidance out to our sexual assault and domestic violence programs on just what to do. The thing that I heard loud and clear from all funders, OAG, CJD, Governor's Office, everybody, is that the sooner you know there's gonna be changes, the, it's, the adjustments are better to make before the end of the grant. There is a school of thought that people will wait to the end of the grant and just see what line items are off and then just make adjustments there. That apparently is frowned upon. <laughs> and I, I, I don't know the wisdom there. Mark could probably tell us why that's not a good idea. I thought that was like, oh, we'll just spend down and then we just kind of move things within line items, but they would prefer to see you proactively <laughs> do that. So, so there's that. So again, Mark, if you can get back to that, I went around the, around the block a couple of times on that one, but the, the okay. question was, if actual percentage staff time spent on the project varies month to month, mm -hmm. how do you reflect this in your FSRs and budget adjustments? That was my answer. And so Mark, I wanted to kind of get you to throw in your thoughts on that. One of the things about the FTE is a full-time equivalency is that that's an annual, uh, annualized in the sense that you're taking your annual uh, person's uh, award in that sense, uh, let's say at the very first, it's 51,000. And then what is the actual cost for that particular grant will give you that percentage of FTE. Well, that's on an annual basis not every month will be the same across the board because life happens. You, you have victims that come in that may be different in, in the situation. So uh, let's say in a, a program like a, a dual program with domestic violence and sexual assault, you may end up with more one, one month of one type and that instead of the other. Uh, the thing that I talk about as an auditor uh, would be that if you have a big swing like that, it's good to do a time study analysis, do a quarter, let's say, and see how much difference it is from what you thought you did, you were planning when you did the award or the application. If it's significant, then I would go ahead and do a budget adjustment to get it back to what would be real in that situation. If it isn't, which most cases happen, is that one month you might have more uh, of one type of uh, services versus another, but within a three year, a three, quarter, three months, a quarter, uh, it may even out. I would not make that much of a difference. It's just that it will eventually catch up in that situation, uh, as long as you're charging by that amount and everything else. So. If you have uh, a little bit less one month on your charge because of the time, but it goes over a little bit more on the other, uh, but it's because of the, uh, the activities and everything, you should be okay. The, the thing about it is once you see a lot of that change in one sense, look at it to see if it's going to be significant. And that would be my uh, thought about another reason to do a budget adjustment is that uh, if you're experiencing that situation, you may have to do two. You may have to do it with one grant here and another grant because now you realize that uh, at, because of, of when you're doing the application, that's you know, six, about three or four months before the actual grant starts and then you get into it, that's another three or four months. It's almost six months to a year of when you actually wrote the grant and now you know more. So you can then make those adjustments across the board. 
uh, that's how I would take care of it in that situation. So think about it. Yes, uh, your percentage on your FTE should be about the same each each month because that's what you thought was going to happen with that particular person. If it deviates greatly, again, that would be my suggestion. Again, uh, this is just a, a type of, I think, a kind of like a roadmap. You use the Excel, you put in your information in there. One thing about the friends, the reason I break it out a lot is that even though it's in one cost category, auditors will go in and they'll look at how much was your salary, how much was the uh, uh, friends and everything. So this is a good way to kind of track that at the same time. So uh, this I, I really like, I call it my little roadmap to uh, uh, go into the e-grant system. So let's do this. So if you have any questions about that, you can always contact me uh, uh, at the front end and the back end of this presentation or my information, my email and uh, my phone to go through. So now we're talking about actually taking that worksheet, I call it worksheet because it's a roadmap, and go into eGrants. So what you will see in eGrants, uh, eGrants is a, uh, a, a database and the database is broken up into tabs as we go along. So as you go in there for an adjustment, you'll need to go into the budget tab to make that uh, adjustment. And then you go into the adjust request adjustment tab to go in there. Then it will give you a kind of an option about modify, increase, decrease. And then at the end, it will give you the kind of uh, doing the adjustment uh, justifications. So am I taking it right now? We've already gone into that section. We've hit the budget tab. We've hit the re request adjustment tab. And now we've actually hit the uh, modified current budget. And as we go in, the very last thing we'll do will be the adjustment uh, justification. Uh, on the front end, anytime you're doing a modification or any budget adjustment, they'll need to be a uh, justification so that the grant manager can look at it, see that it's reasonable, and then uh, allow it to, to go forward. So we're taking uh, shots. Uh, these are actually out of the governor's office uh, uh, presentation uh, done by Jason Buckner and uh, to show where you would go. So once you get into <laughs> Can somebody mute their mic so everybody can hear? Thank you. So in this case, you've got you're already up to your part of your grant that you want to make the adjustment. You'll go in and you can see the tabs at the top, and with that arrow, it says budget. So you're now setting up the database to go for the budget part and the second line of tabs will then give you what where you want to go in the database to actually impact it. So in this case you're doing a request for an adjustment. As we go through the request of adjustment it will follow down and it will ask you do you want to do modified, increase, decrease, or the G, GPI. In this scenario we're doing uh, a modification. We're just moving dollars from one cost category to another. As you go through that and you've now set up your, your adjustment uh, modification, it will then ask you here to do uh, a justification. It may be one of the questions is that in your adjustment is that uh, due to uh, turnover uh, in a position, uh, dollars have been reallocated for other uh, uh, for other activities. That might be a justification. You can work it uh, by whatever your justification for those dollars uh, that dollars were not spent or something, and then uh, provide that. That is the key there. One of the key uh, um, errors that happen over here is that. 
some people get very detailed saying, well, this is where I do my budget adjustment. So I'm going to fill it out and say that, and give the, give the justification, but also give all the information. I'm moving a thousand dollars from, uh, let's say the counselor to, and then a thousand dollars to the bilingual and, um, and provide that information and think that the database will then take all that information and put it into your budget. It doesn't do that. This area is just to provide uh, justification so that uh, we can move forward with, uh, with a good justification. So uh, I have seen that and I've had uh, uh, been contacted several times on why it's locking me out or I'm not receiving the, uh, the, a good status on my justification. And it's because thinking of this, that's only a one line item and it doesn't impact all your budget line items in that situation. So I'd be very careful. Make it general, make it uh, to where the reason why you need to do this and you will be in good shape. Finally, once you get through that process, you'll get into the detailed budget process. And that part now, as you go again, you're still in your budget tab, but then it'll actually, you go into the next tab, which is details. So as you can see on the screen, we still have it at the top row. It's in budget, but now that we've gone through and we've been able to get the request through the process uh, for approval of, of justifications and everything and what type, then we actually go into the detail. And you can see there that when you hit detail, you look at the bottom and you can see that it's all the cost categories in that direction. So it's personnel, contractual, travel, equipment, and supplies. Now in this situation, as our sample, we would have gone in on the first one and only worked with personnel since we were just moving dollars from one position to another. On the second scenario, we would have used, uh, we would have first clicked to get the personnel, fix the personnel in your budget adjustment, which you could see from Excel spreadsheet, and then go down to supplies and direct operating expense, which is your other ODOE in that situation. There you would also fix your uh, adjustment by de in detail. So when you click that, it would give you the detail part and provide that information. So let's say with personnel, we've gone in there. Now we provide the information about that position, the amount of money that will be in there. And again, we're looking at the annual part and again, as you can see down at the very bottom, there is a percentage of salary, which is your FTE. That's why it's always, uh, I like that kind of spreadsheet because it gives me that information. I don't have to go back and forth and looking for things. I've already worked on it prior to doing that. Now, the other parts of that is uh, there is an area for a cash match, for our in-kind match, uh, and also for program income, uh, unless you're impacting a personnel that has match, uh, you would probably not use any of those areas. And again, uh, program income is very rare that it happens. So now you've impacted that, let's say for this first scenario, which is uh, personnel only, we would have gone through this one and the next to um, get that position set. After that, then if you're okay and clean, you would then get this button where you can go in for the, to certify your tab at this point. This is a good area that if everything works out fine, the database you put in information in and you reconcile so you have the same amount of dollars that you've deobligated, reobligated back in, you can go into the certified adjustment tab and down at the bottom, you'll see that uh, since uh, you can do a certified adjustment and that will allow you to go ahead and the system will take that uh, uh, budget adjustment at the same time. If you look above that, there's areas where there may be errors that would come up and that would pop up. If that pops up, then you will not be able to use your, uh, that button of certified adjustment. Okay, Mark, I'm yeah. sorry, I have a couple of things to yeah, add. 
lessons learned here. Um, so the certification process, um, I'll say this in two ways. So, so one, again, as I mentioned earlier, I, I think what I learned when I started doing this process is, as a new uh, CEO uh, slash like just kind of setting up the new financial system I wanted to see. Uh, what I learned really with eGrants, I have to say this, eGrants taught me is that eGrants itself, although it is a little counterintuitive uh, and I just didn't quite understand it immediately. Um, what it taught me though was that if it's if you find it difficult to do anything in eGrants, it's really what's happening is you need to really look at what are your internal processes, what's your preparation, what's what what is what does that look like? Uh, so certifying adjustments, for example, the way eGrants is set up is that you can have someone go in. So technically, you can have your your pro your person who's supervising this program that's being funded by this particular grant could go in there and make those changes because they're going to be intimately familiar with, you know, with the staffing, with, you know, with the, the, the spending down of the grant. Uh, and that's a really nice internal control as well. I have seen that, and, 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 and I'll be honest, TASA was used to be this way where um, we had the finance person making all those decisions. I, I personally would stay away from that. I think they're, to have more internal control, there should be more of a transparent process on those budgets, how they're developed, why they're developed, uh, tying it back to the RFA for this grant. And also when there's any changes, the person who's supervising the staff, the, the, they're again, intimately knowledgeable of what's happening. They should be the ones to have a say in that budget. Now, in this, the way eGrants set up, it's set up for like if someone else who's intimately involved in, the, in that process has this change that they feel like the, they need to make in the budget, of course, there should be those discussions on the on the back end internally in y'all's office, but it also is set up where just not one person should be able to go in there and make all these changes. The certification adjustment button is for like, if in my, I'll give my example would be Rick Gipperidge. Rick is over one of the programs at TASA. I have him helping me write those applications to get the, the CGD application. Um, he's gonna manage that particular project so him and I have come together with the budget because I'm, I'm, of course, going to make sure it fits our org budget, which is what I'm responsible for. And so whenever he sees adjustments that need to be made, made, he can go in there. We talk about it. Our system is that we talk about it. He'll come and ask me. We'll brainstorm. He goes in and he makes them. And then I go in and check, again, internal control, I, in my mind. I go in and I look at what he's made, and then I certify it. So all that has happened before it's even made it to the governor's office. Um, then they look at it and they may say, you know, Rose, your math is bad. Okay, oops, let me go in there and add, you know, so they may have asked for some clarification, but the, 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 the heaviest lift, which is why we're making this adjustment, how does it affect your org budget? Those are internal processes. So again, outside the scope of this particular um, webinar, but I did want, I, I just think it's so important to, for us to have that conversation, for you all to have that conversation or, or, or think about what are my internal processes? How transparent is my accounting system? Uh, how do we bill these things? And, and, and how do we, do we even do a budget to actual general ledger before the FSRs? So again, those are all internal processes that once they're established, it, it's really, eGrants just kind of complements that all together. So, um, I'll maybe talk a little bit more about that here in a second, but I just wanted to say that. And if you have any questions about any of that um, or feel like, hey, maybe we should do a webinar on this one thing that you just said or that you and Mark said, we'd be happy to do that as well. Again, my goal is for sexual assault programs and domestic violence programs um, is to build strong infrastructures because that means survivors are gonna get served. I feel like we are, our work is similar. You all do the, 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 the great work of serving survivors of human trafficking, child sex trafficking. And so we also are, are doing some of that work and our programs are probably some of the same. So we wanna help you all as well. Not that we have all the answers. It's just that I fumbled enough to know what works. And I think that's the best way to learn this. Um, I didn't fumble hard enough to lose anything, which is that's the scary part, but I don't want anybody else to either, which is why we decided. And I also decided to join Mark in this because I just wanted to share again, my experiences in, you know, coming into this system. As you can see in the slide, uh, above that there's no errors or anything that's prompting at this point. So it'd be okay to go ahead and do 
the certification adjustment button. You'd hit that button. And what you would see next is the next part up here would be that in the status, it would have pending OAG review, OOG review. So now you feel comfortable and confident that you've uh, reconciled everything in your budget adjustment from the full steps that you've done. And now it's only, it's up to the uh, grant manager to review it and make the approval uh, for that budget adjustment. Uh, the other situation would be that let's say that it did have some of those errors up there. What happens would be uh, and the certification button, it would then give an, an area about update P-O-E-T-E -E, uh, and that area would give you the link of the areas that were either out of balance or there's an error or other things like that. And the way it's kind of set up, it would be uh, updating the uh, subcategory line item and then updating the category itself. So in the situation for budgets, you have category I line items that uh, there may be three or four or whatever that equals up to your sub uh, category, which would be in your budget. So let's say travel or uh, personnel or anything, you would be fixing those as you go along and then you go to the next one down. So here's an example of that. This is an example where you're ready to do the uh, certification and you get this box. Well, that looks pretty heavy to me that where are the issues that come up? Well, what I see is that uh, in this area, there's the application of errors and incomplete information. So it's telling you that the uh, database is incomplete in certain areas or there's an error and what that would be. And you would then go in and hit that de uh, the budget details and it would take you right back to the spot and you would then kind of fix that as you move along uh, across the board. And what you do is you re resolve all of these as they're resolved, it will take care of kind of the conditions that we're going through. And you will end up with then uh, it coming back with the clear uh, slide that you saw before. And that would allow you to then do the certified adjustment button. But you can see in this uh, situation, uh, since there's so much information and where the errors are in there, you'll be able to see that that certified uh, adjustment button is actually grayed out. So it will, it will not allow you to go further until you fix those uh, uh, areas that are out of balance. So once you resolve all the line items that you've needed, uh, you can then click uh, clarify the button so that you can submit. And then when it does uh, go through that, it will then go back again to that review where the status pending at the top of the uh, that spreadsheet will have a status pending OOG review. So that will be the grant manager that will review it. So now you've gone through two parts. Either you've been able to go through it the first time without any errors and get to the status pending, or in the second case was that uh, there were some errors and you know where to go is a link and fix those specific things. Some of the errors might be just a transpositional error uh, in that situation. That's easy for it to happen uh, in that part and all you do is just fix that error. If anybody has any questions, this is a good time to just uh, ask us at this point. One of the things that you can do is First, ask the question on, on the chat. Uh, we'll try to answer it like we have. If you need more clarification, that's the time when you can unmute your uh, mic and then ask for the clarification. Again, what we'll do is we'll take any of the questions that you have at this point uh, and try to fix that and do the FAQs. The other part, uh, you'll have my email address and everything and it's like me if uh, when I, Whenever you go to the doctor, you tell them things that you think you will uh, remember to ask. 
And the minute that you actually close the door on the doctor's office, you go, oh my God, I forgot to tell him about such and such. Well, that's the time to go ahead and just email me with your question after this. We will still keep it open for, not this part, but we'll keep the questions open for about a week or two. So expect uh, FAQs if there are any to be about two weeks out because I like to give enough time for people to think about it, ask questions, and then we can answer it. We'll answer the question uh, individually from the email, but then we'll put it on the FAQ because I think it's always valuable for people to see other questions say, oh, I had that question before, or I had that issue, now I know how to resolve it. That's kind of where we are. Uh, other things is that we are gonna do a couple more uh, webinars for the governor's office. The next one will be on time and effort reporting and personnel files. Uh, that will be uh, one of the areas. Uh, what we plan to do with that is uh, we're already working on several timesheets that have come in from our, our, our membership and we're working through that to do the analysis. If you would like to send your timesheet uh, for us to review to ensure that you're in compliance, we will then uh, uh, let you know as we go along. We will analyze the timesheet and then uh, if there's uh, areas of, uh, of strengthening up the timesheet, we will contact you and uh, help that process go along. Uh, time and effort is a very, very important part because uh, personnel is easily 80 to almost 90% of the grant. So if you have your time and effort reports, uh, your timesheets not in compliance, that's gonna severely impact uh, the money that you're gonna have to pay back at the same time and question costs. The other part is we've been asking not only for timesheets of, uh, of an individual staff members on the grant, but because of the VOCA part, a lot of people will use volunteers for their match. And uh, what I've seen before is that uh, if your timesheet and your volunteers are not in uh, compliance, that will impact you financially at the same time. And it probably impacts you a little bit more primarily because it's a 20% match. So if, you're, uh, if you have a finding in uh, your in-kind because of timesheets, it's gonna cost you more because it's uh, that 20% they, they, um, they calculated out by that 20%. And so an error can actually be several thousand dollars. Does anybody else have any questions? Uh, at this time, we'll keep it open for a little bit. Rose, do you have any uh, well, thing that you would like to add? Oh, Finian, yes. Yeah, I have um, uh, Karen and um, Brooke. They mm -hmm. are asking for their PowerPoint that we just presented, if you, you can send it to them. We can do that. Uh, we are gonna have this set up. It's on record so that you can go back through it, but I could probably send the copy, uh, a PDF copy of the slides, if need be, we can do that. Okay. And also the spreadsheet. One person didn't receive it. Um, Alejandro, he Alejandro didn't receive it. And the question? Uh, she needs uh, the spreadsheet, the okay. sales spreadsheet sent to her, yeah. Okay, yeah, then uh, we can do that uh, across the board. Uh, I can send out individually for uh, each uh, person that requests that, the spreadsheet. Uh, I think it's a good spreadsheet to work through. Uh, I, th I think it's just easier to have something as your roadmap as you go along. So yes, we can do that. Mark, I think this was great. Thank you so much um, for the nuts and bolts. And I know, again, a lot of you are already in the process and are probably super familiar with this. I'm hoping that, you know, we were able to provide something to help, but we do have a series that we wanted to, 
to help, you know, to help get to the, the kind of the root cause of some of these issues. Um, again, something that I feel very strongly about is, you know, if you, if you find that you're having difficulties with this, just maybe have, take a second to think about your internal processes and what those look like. Um, and again, um, you know, keeping that clear, transparent system uh, of, of accountability for your finance. Uh, like, for example, every receipt you want to have, make sure that's coded to whatever grant it's supposed to go to. And you can only do that or know how to do that if everyone is familiar with the RFA and the purpose of the grant. So just a lot of homework, homeworky stuff, but we're happy to um, continue to um, provide that information at all or, or actually learn from you. I'm sure there's some things that you all are doing that we could learn from. So I, I personally would love to learn from you as well. The last thing, uh, this well, slide just gives you the information if you want to contact me at any time. Um, the way we've got to set up or with our VOCA grant, uh, I can provide uh, technical assistance for a, a wide variety of issues in that situation. Uh, uh, the good part of the VOCA grant, because it's a capacity building grant, I can look at uh, funds not only for the grant that you're on, but I can look at unrestricted funds or restricted funds if you happen to have uh, a grant with another agency like the Attorney General's Office or HHSC. Uh, this allows me to do that uh, because we're looking at uh, the infrastructure and that's what capacity building is doing, to do the infrastructure so that you can comply with uh, any grant that out, that's out there. I can also look at uh, if you have a foundation grant, I can help you with that. Uh, some of the things that I've done uh, over the years in providing services is if you have a monitoring report from, uh, uh, from the governor's office or from one of the others, and you need uh, assistance with corrective action plans, I can help you with that across the board. Uh, we have information, uh, I'm an ex-auditor, I used to be an auditor's auditor where I would be going out and reviewing CPA firms on their audits of school districts and others. So I understand the process and that helps me to, to provide assistance. So if you're getting ready to be audited and you want some additional assistance uh, to prepare, that's an area that I can do at the same time. We do have other people that provide a lot of assistance in, in other areas with uh, programmatic uh, areas across the board. Uh, so you could use us in that direction. The other thing I tell people, uh, I've had people that would work with me for a little bit and then they, they're, they're concerned of uh, using up my time in that sense. I'm never too busy. Uh, you, if you ask a question, you're actually helping me at the same time because I'm on a grant we do have metrics and that helps me meet my metrics. So it's a, a good partnership. Hi, Mark. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, uh, MG. Go ahead. Um, I have a question. Do you, can you go over how to defund, I don't know if that's the right term, but how to defund a grant? Oh, are you talking about, uh, asking to uh, end a grant in the sense that you, yes. uh, you received an award and then you decided not to take it at that Correct. point? Uh, probably the best way to do is go through your uh, grant manager because I would imagine what they would want to have first is some, some, something in letterhead explaining why you decided not to take the grant. That has happened before. Uh, I've had, um, I guess, about 20 years of experience, and I've seen that happen oh, it, in, in certain cases. I won't say it's something that's happened quite often, but it does happen at the same time. For whatever reason, uh, the organization decides not to, do, uh, to follow with that grant, then you, the best thing is to contact the grant manager. And in that case, since you want to take the whole the obligate and and not accept the the grant. That would be the the best way to do that first. They will then give okay. you the 
they will then give you the uh, information on doing that. Uh, it may be that if you haven't spent any money at all on the grant in your, you want to uh, be obligated in that situation, they, it might be an easier process than just going through the, uh, the obligation process in the budget adjustment. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mark, Mark another, another question. Okay. Um, Dominique Jones wants to know, do you have a suggested timesheet template? Uh, that's what we're working on for our next uh, webinar. And uh, I, we have some that we're reviewing at this point. Uh, and uh, to make sure that it fits into compliance with the TCFR uh, Part 200. Uh, if you want to submit that for me to look at, we can do that. Uh, we're hoping that by next month we will have the webinar on time and effort and personnel. Uh, the reason I like to keep those two together is that uh, when uh, auditors go out, they're naturally going to look at the uh, timesheet itself. But if it's on an on-site, they will look at personnel files and uh, having the information to make sure that uh, you're complete with what kind of folder or files you have to, to ensure compliance. Is that helpful for any follow up on that? Dominique? I'll be looking forward to that next webinar for timesheets. I know those are a lot of questions I get too. And there's been a lot of different type of guidance. I'm not saying from funders, but just guidance out there. And so I am looking forward to Mark um, that webinar on timesheets as we, you know, are, we'll give the directions that we know are in compliant with, you know, um, with grants and with the CFRs, things like that. So thank you all so much. I mean, Mark, I don't know if you have anything else, but I hope that this, again, was somewhat helpful. We'll, we'll continue to try to make this better uh, to, to meet your needs. The, the, I can say this, the governor's office uh, wants, you know, wants to partner with each of their grantees to ensure that we are using that money for the state of Texas. I think that they do a great job of getting that money out to the, to the ground. I think in doing so, they just have these rules that we all have to follow. All of us have to adhere to something and someone, as do they. So I think that their e-grant system is, is, is a part of that. I think that um, <clears throat> us having our internal processes to align with, especially the CFR and all those rules, would be uh, helpful. And so we, we're here to have those conversations. Again, not that we have all the answers. We can share. I can always share how I fell on my face, and that usually is good to help somebody else so they don't fall on their face as much. Um, and just kind of what we've done to help align our stuff. Again, I will say this over and over again, we need uh, transparent uh, financial and accounting processes where every penny is directed to something and you should build your finance system around that. That makes everything easier when it comes to FSRs, when it comes to all that stuff. So thank y'all. Mark? Yes. Mark. Uh, Do Dominic uh, just has a question. Okay. Uh, she is there another key person to contact about programmatic support, or should we reach out to Mark as well? Well, we can do it one of two ways. You can talk. Uh, somebody can contact me, and I will get them to the right position place. We do have uh, uh, a lot of great trainers out there. Uh, some that do human trafficking. Some that do. Uh, the uh, specific kind of grant related stuff, uh, rape prevention education. We've got trainers that work with uh, law enforcement. Uh, we've got a lot of different uh, people that can help in that situation to provide that. Okay. So that, so Dominique, you can just contact me and then I will forward it to the appropriate uh, supervisor that will then handle that for us. Okay. That's all the question I have. 
All right. Well, I think we're just about done. Mark's got his information there. And if I can be of service, uh, Mark can get a hold of me or you all can get a hold of me. I'm the same. It's R. Luna at TASA instead of M. Hernandez, if you have a question for me. Um, but we're all in this together. We're partners with you. Um, and we all, again, are in the same boat as, as in that we're all grantees <laughs> to um, CJD, uh, to governor's office. And I really appreciate how they are very how they partner with us so that we all have the same information and know and just have our bumpers and our rules that we all follow and then everything is will work but sometimes it's hard to kind of make all that align so so thank you thank you thank you